All right, Sarah. Sarah, where are you from originally? Where'd you grow up? Um, Orange County. Yeah. And tell me about your family. Um, my mom and my dad were married. They had um, three kids. Um, I have two older brothers. And um, my mom died when I was five. Mm. How'd you lose your mom? Um, on Thanksgiving, uh, my mom, my, right before my mom passed away, she separated with my dad. So her and her boyfriend uh, had me in the car and we were going to my grandma's for Thanksgiving. My dad and my brothers went in another car. And um, like a sheriff, it was like a sheriff's wife. She had ran a red light and um, hit us and the car like slipped over. Um, her boyfriend had like a broken collarbone um, and then she passed away. Um, and then I, I, I was fine, like I was, I guess I was just like throwing up a lot all night from like shock or something, but, but yeah, like, um, so like I haven't had a mom like pretty much my whole life. So like, it doesn't really like, I feel like kind of like sometimes I don't know what it's like to have a mom. Like I have two kids actually. Um, sometimes I feel like that's part of why, like I've had such a struggle with like motherhood. Like my one child is with, his father and my other child was taken away um, due to some things, but yeah. So um, anyways, but um, yeah, so my dad raised us. We lived pretty well, like we lived in Mission Viejo. Um, like he, guess I showed us love like financially, like we had a lot of, we, we were comfortable, you know, like middle class, I guess. And um, my older brother, like, uh, he had found out that, so my dad and mom had met when um, they knew each other in the office and she was pregnant she, with another man and had the baby and, and he left when, when my brother was four da days old, um, he said, I can't do this and walked out the door. Well, so my mom and dad started dating when my brother was basically just like an infant. So he's been my brother's dad his whole life, you know? But they never um, like went through and actually like did the paperwork to adopt him. So when my mom died, when my brother was like 13, he had to deal with like finding out his mother died and finding out that his father, who he thought was his father, wasn't his father. And his real father was a drug addict and he didn't give a fuck. The day he was supposed to show up to tell him he was his father, didn't even show up. Cause my dad was like, I'm not going to do it. I'm not going to, I'm not going to like do that for you, you know? So anyway, so he started struggling with drugs and like my dad pretty much did everything possible to try to help him. But my brother just kept stealing from him. Like, you know, kept like doing drugs. We, there's paraphernalia everywhere in the house. Like he just was focusing so much on trying to help Chris. Like his friends and family were like, you have two other kids you like need to take care of, you know? And so I just grew up kind of seeing that, like finding spoons and like the little heroin balloons. And like, I remember like coming home from vacation once and being like, daddy, daddy, like Chris threw a party, like there's balloons, you know? And my dad was just like, oh my God, like, give me that, you know? So he got out of the house. And it ended up later on that me and my brother would end up like using drugs together as like a way to like bond. Um, but, um, yeah, like, so, so then I started acting out. Um, I think because of that, my dad was, he was depressed, you know. My dad's gay. <laughs> yeah, super weird. I found out when I was, like, 18, 18, my dad, like, was gay, and, like, my whole life, I thought, like, yeah, he kept that from us. Anyways, but, and he has HIV, and I found that out when I was young. There's just been, like, a lot of secrets in my family, like, um, there's a lot of things that have like come to light. Like my uncle like committed suicide, he hung himself and we were lied to our whole lives and told like that he like choked on like throw up on his sleep. Like there's just been like all these family secrets and it's just as I was getting older, I was just kind of like, you know, like you're not supposed to lie to your children. Like I know a lot of it was to protect us, but it just felt like really confusing. And so, um, um, like I had a friend's mom, she tried to adopt me because she didn't feel like my dad was like 
taking like care of us, you know? Um, and so I went to go live with them. Like nothing was done in the court, but just whatever. And uh, she had an older brother. I didn't know he was a drug addict or addicted to like heroin. Supposedly he was clean, but I didn't know. But he was 22 and I was 15. And I went upstairs like, and uh, he was there. And we were watching TV and he's like, oh, do you want to smoke? And at the time I was smoking weed. I was like a little pothead. And so um, I thought he meant weed. So I went upstairs I'm like, yeah, sure. And I saw the foil and, you know, I knew just from like my brother what it was, like that it was heroin. And I was always so against it. Like I was like, I'm never gonna do that. Like I'm never gonna use heroin. It's so horrible. And it was just so pathetic looking back that it's like, I literally like everything that's led me up to my life at this point was like peer pressure of not wanting to look stupid. Like, like, you know, it's like I'm homeless on the streets now. I've lost everything, I've lost my kids. And it's just like over like being a 15 year old who just wanted to like fit in basically. You know what I mean? So, um, so um, I started using, thank you. I started using heroin with him. He he's the one who like shot me up for the first time. We dated. And then um after that, like my family didn't know, but after that it just became like a wreck pretty quick. Like nineteen years old, I was a stripper. I was dating like a fifty year old sugar daddy, like <laughs> I was definitely like the epitome of like a girl who had daddy issues, <laughs> you know, but um, I don't know, like it's it's just been rough. Like I came, I came to LA like literally to pick up drugs. I was addicted to heroin and I was getting heroin that was cut with fentanyl and I wasn't aware of it. Like, and my dealer got arrested and I was trying all these different heroin and it wasn't getting me high. I was like, what the heck? And someone told me, oh, it's cut with fentanyl. I can get some for you, but it's in LA. So I started driving out to LA to pick up fentanyl. Well, I ended up being like, why drive back? I'll just stay in my car out here and, and, and pick up, be able to be near the connect. So that ended up me living out of my car out here. Slowly, I lost my car now homeless i was staying in a tent and then after that i was staying in like an abandoned house um the cops came and got me out and now i'm just like living out of a suitcase just like bouncing around with strangers <laughs> so yeah i'm 29 years old i have two kids you know and um uh, it's definitely like something that like, looking back, it, I wasn't like, it was, it used to be so much fun, you know, like to get high. It used to be like, oh my God, it's a good feeling. And now it's just like, there's been so much that's happened. It's almost just like, I'm just getting like obliterated, uh, trying to get obliterated every day just to forget everything that's like resulted from it. Like, you know what I mean? It's like kind of like ass backwards. I never thought there'd be like a day where like, I could say like, I have friends that have been shot, murdered, stabbed. Like, like when you start like dealing with people that are like murderers, like shooting people, stabbing people, robbing people, it's like, you think like your rock bottom is, you think you've hit your rock bottom. I thought I hit it when I lost my kids. And it's just like, you don't realize like it, sometimes like how far down rock bottom can really be. Like I used to see people lying on the streets and I would judge them, you know? I would be like, who could do that? Like who could just sleep on the street like that? They're so weird. And I'm like at the point in my life where I'm like, I get that. Like 
I get like being so exhausted and just like mentally tired and having nothing and just you just don't care where you lie down you're just like fuck you know and it's just like I never thought growing up I just never thought that this would be my life you know but it just feels like sometimes it's just too much to go back like if I were to rejoin society I wouldn't even know like what to do you know I haven't worked in 10 years. Like, it just feels like sometimes it's like, what, like, I feel like I'm an alien and to like regain that, like, it just feels like it's, it's too hard. It's too like, like, like overdosing and dying is like not even like, doesn't seem like that bad anymore. It almost would be like a relief, you know? Because at least then, you know, like, fuck, you wouldn't have to just keep like struggling, you know? But, but yeah, I mean, it's not that crazy, but <laughs> I don't know. What emotions do you go through? It sounds like the shame is what yeah. piles on. From your kids and from everything else. Yeah, the shame, like... And it becomes intimidating to try to even get out. Yeah, like, I, I've i always cared a lot what people thought about me, you know? Like, I can remember being little and my dad telling me, like, Sarah, like, you know, you've got to make sure you marry rich because all you have is your looks. Like, you, you're not smart. Like, so you got to gotta make sure you marry well because... And like just hearing that as like a little girl, it's just like, it's like, like I would never, as an adult now, I would never say that to my child. You know what I mean? Like I would never make them feel like that all their worth and their value is is like physical beauty. And then when you're a drug act and you're losing it, I know that sounds vain, but it's kind of like you're like, shit, like. <laughs> Like, you know, like when when people start recognizing you places and like like when I've had people come up to me and be like, I can tell you're on the streets and stuff. And it's just like your ego is like, damn, like it's like that. Like I can't even hide. I can't even hide it anymore. Like like I'm going places and people are, are like can tell. And it's just like, you know, it, there used to be like some comfort in knowing I could like hide it and I could be like a covert addict, you know, and it's just like, I always had a clean record. And then when they took my kids away, uh, my house got raided because my father, my child was on probation and he was selling drugs and, um, he, um, Basically, like, basically, I, I, I got charged for his drugs. And, like, he, at the end of it, they brought him in handcuffs. I didn't know he was with them. Like, he was in the cop car. I guess he, like, led me to, led them to our house. He thought I was cheating on him. He was crazy. He was psycho. I honestly think he did it to get back at me because he thought I was cheating when I wasn't even cheating. Um... Either way, I shouldn't have been with a guy who was selling drugs and having children, you know what I mean? But it went from a clean record to now I have um, felony sales, felony sales over an ounce, felony child endangerment. And those are not charges, like I was always so proud of like having a clean record and then to go from that to that and just sitting next to the person you thought was like the the person you love and is closest to you and they come in handcuffs and they're looking at you laughing and knowing that nothing happened to them and it's all on you like like my brother has had situations happen with his wife and he always took the rap for her and I always thought like oh like my my man would hold me down and like 
And it's not like that. Like when you do drugs and you hang out with drug addicts, you're alone. Like you're you're always alone. You know? I used to believe people and like that people were gonna like save me or like, yeah, I'll watch your stuff or yeah. And now it's just like not even like a question. I'm just like, no, I'm good. Because it's just like you you just kinda like lose like your light and like your hope and like humanity because you just are like constantly around just people who are smiling in your face but with just so much as like stabbing the back would would probably if you overdosed they would be picking your pockets i i, I know some people who a guy overdosed in um their tent my friend went by the tent uh there was a dead body tent that had been in there for four days. Top pockets turned out. No one called the police. Nothing. And they were telling my friend, oh, no, don't call the cop. Like, just just really foul and disgusting. Like, just sad. Just to know that that's, like, someone's, like, brother or someone's son. And, like, that he was basically, like, his like desecrated and like just like like I don't know that's just like so like heartbreaking to know that you know like and and just to know that like the level of like that drugs can take you that like there can be a living human being and you are so selfish to care so much about your own addiction that a person can die and you won't even move their dead body or call the cops or get them help. And you would take the shoes off their feet and search their pockets and then just walk around like everything's good. Like, that's the crazy part. Like, it's just the stories out here are crazy. I have another friend who um, they think that the people that he was living with, he had an apartment and you know, there's scumbags out here. So having apartments like a big deal well, they think because he wanted his apartment that they gave him like a hot shot or something. Not like they gave him something. He ended up having like a a, sh a stroke, went into a coma and all this. And they're living in his apartment and all this shit's gone. And and they're talking about it like, 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 huh, oh, yeah, did you hear? Yeah, they pulled the plug on so-and-so. And it's just like, wow, like, like this man like gave you a place to stay and like you're now like living here without his consent and like you're talking like he's dead like he's gone and you're talking about it like it's like oh yeah like 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 it's nothing like like as long as you're high like that's all that matters you know what i mean it's it's disgusting it's really disgusting what is your drug now? Um, God, what is it? I, I use hair. I, I use fent no, no. Sorry, we kept talking about heroin earlier. Um, I use fentanyl, methamphetamines, and Xanax. Like the fentanyl is like my main drug I'm addicted to, and I also use the methamphetamines because so the fentanyl doesn't get me too down. And then I have so much anxiety. <laughs> that like I use a Xanax too. It's like, it comes to the point where it's like, I feel like I've had to add so much stuff in just to make me be able to like walk around and function that it's like, it's like pretty much just like self-medicating. I have a broken arm right now, broken wrist. I've had it for two months. I didn't know it was broken. My ex <clears throat> did it to me and, um, he said, you're being a baby. It's 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 probably just spraying, you know? Stop, like, and then, and I just went to the hospital um, like a week ago for something else. I had an abscess and they told me, they're like, your wrist is broken. Like, it's, we need to <laughs> re-break your wrist, put pins in it. Like, we need to get your referral for an orthopedic surgeon. And to know, like, for two months, I've been walking around with a fucking broken wrist and all because what, like, like my 
boyfriend, my ex-boyfriend said like, you know, like, I don't know, all because like the people around you just, I don't know, it's, it's just a trip. It, it, it's like when it starts affecting your health, like I went in there with a broken wrist, two abscesses, and then um, a concussion from like a head wound. And like the nurses were just telling me, they're like, dude, like what are you, like your health, like, like what are you doing? And I was just like, I don't know, it's, I hate, I'm afraid of hospitals and I think it has to do with being an addict. You're afraid of like authority, cops. And I think sometimes hospitals get kind of like shooed in with that, you know? And so, and you just don't want to deal with it. It's just like, oh, well, I got to get my fix. Like I don't have time to do it or, or I need to be high enough to go do it or whatever, you know? But yeah, so I got to handle that situation. <laughs> What are you afraid of now? Honestly, I'm afraid of my sons growing up and thinking that I didn't love them and that I didn't want want them and to become like me I don't want them to ever use drugs or like I don't ever want them to have to like go the places that I have gone you know what I mean I just want them to like do well and succeed and be happy and like I know they're they don't understand why I'm not around, you know? It, it's like mommy's, mommy's sick, you know? But you can only really get away with that for so long. It's been a year now since I've seen my oldest. It's been two years since I've seen my youngest. My youngest was taken away when he was um, three. I know he when he was two. And my oldest is with his dad, and he's um, six. And I was a good mom. I was a really good mom. You know, I was wanting to have kids, and I was a really good mom. And it just really sucks because it's like he they know like they're gonna grow up with that you know i hate that my i hate that like i've gifted them in a sense with my pain like i've not gifted them because it's terrible but you know we inherit our we inherit our parents um their issues and things and it's just so terrible to know like that like I'm basically like giving my sons the pain of like an absentee mother and thinking that like their mom chose dope over them and from the outside looking in it's like I love my sons I love my sons. And I, it's so hard because everyone thinks it's like you choose drugs over them, but it's like, it's just not so simple. It's, it's like people don't get like how hard it is, you know? Have you tried to quit? I've gone to rehab seven times. Um, when I was trying to get my son back, well, I went to... I detox once when I was like younger and then um, another detox like a few years after that and then when I lost my kids I was like I'm gonna get my kids back and I just like 
I would go in and I would just like freak out <laughs> and, and leave. Like I would start doing well. It was, it, it was like, I would start doing well and I would like sabotage myself. Like I would self-sabotage. It was just like, all I know now is like this fucking pain and like to be like, feel good and happy and to love myself and to like be healthy and like to be in healthy relationships is like, it's almost like scary. Like, you know what I mean? It's like, you're not used to that. You know what I mean? But I don't know. I, I still want to get sober. I still, I still think I still have my pipe dream of like, oh, I, I am going to get sober. You know, one day, I mean, I guess I don't really say that that much anymore. Is, is fentanyl that difficult to, to not relapse on? It's honestly like I can handle the detox. Like I can handle like the physical detox if it's painful, but like I know I can make it through. I've made it through it in jail, you know, like. It's just the like compounding of like when you're coming off the drugs and then like all the shame and things you've um, all the things you've done while you were like loaded and things that you never would have done if you weren't and and all the people you hurt and 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 it just all comes like flooding in you when you're sober. It's like just almost like too much. It's like overwhelming. It's like like I, I it's like I've repressed it for a reason, you know, but you know it's like you have to deal with those things eventually. And it's like what other choice is there? I know it sounds cheesy, but it's just like I wish I would have like stayed in like a program and like listened when they said like all that addicts. All it leads to is when addiction is jail or death, and it's really true. Like, I've never had so many friends and people I know die, like, within the past, like, year. Some of them aren't even fentanyl addicts. There's a lot of friends I know, too, that have, there might be, like, addicted to meth, and they got meth laced with fentanyl or, you know? And so it's just, like, other people stab, rob, shot, like, like, I'm a white girl from Orange County. Like, if you would have asked me 10 years ago if I would have been having exchanges with gang members and having people I know that are, like, shot and stabbed and all this stuff, I would have, like, laughed in your face. Like, I, I was... Where are you staying now? I'm on the streets now. I just, wherever the wind takes me. <laughs> and how do you make money? Um, honestly, like, I, st I like, I go and I steal from stores, I boost, but really just like, finessing. <laughs> I feel like sometimes, like, my grandma used to say, like, I would make a good lawyer because it's just like, I don't know. I just feel like I've looked. Sometimes I just like. I've had to like lower myself and do things that I just. Wouldn't like wouldn't do. Like. Things I never would have done or people I would have never hung out with. Before, you know, using. I was stripping before to pay for my addiction, you know? And like, I always said I would never escort. I, and I ended up trying it two times. And I was like, I'm never gonna do it again. And I haven't, like, I've been lucky with that, but even just like stripping, I mean, it takes away like, I was raised Catholic, you know, I, I was like, came from a good family. Like, it's like, 
I feel like when I would like, like I have to get fucked up in order to like do it. You know what I mean? Like, and I feel like I have to every day, the people that I'm like trying to get dope from or something, I'm having to like, you're having to play a role. Like, like, oh, this guy, he wants this, he wants this little toy. So I'm, I'm gonna play that role to get what I need to get. And eventually it's like, you've played so many roles, like you kind of lose like who you are, you know? It's just anything, you'll do like anything to just get the drug, whatever that means, you know? Sarah, what would you say is the most important lesson you've learned in your life? Um, important lesson. I don't know, I guess. Just, I wish I would have not cared so much about others, you know? I wish I would have not been in such a rush to grow up. I wish it would have not, like, look to men or physical items to fill a void or hole in myself, you know what I mean? Just learn how to be happy just being, you know what I mean? Um, and just... I don't know. I just wish I, w I would have. I wish I would have just not been in a rush to grow up. I wish I would have just been innocent and a little girl and running around just getting my knees dirty in my little sundress. <laughs> you know, like not like I feel like when you're a teenage girl, it's like everything's so dramatic and you want to be you want to be this adult and like you know, your hormones and you're starting to like boys and this and that. And it's just like, it can all be innocent fun. And people, there are people that can just party in high school and it's over, it's over with. But if you're hanging out with people that are doing like hard drugs, you just, you're probably shouldn't be there. Like, you know what I mean? <laughs> you know, I feel like growing up, it's okay to go to like a keg party and you know, whatever, but if there's someone around you that's like doing like heroin or like these hard drugs, there's there's something wrong. And if there's an older person with an underage person, like that's, there's something not right there, you know? I just never really understood that, like being younger. I'm like, what's the problem if I'm 15 and he's 22? Like my poor father. I was 19, I brought a 50-year-old um, <laughs> boyfriend home. I was going through, I guess, a, a like beginning life crisis. But now he's getting me back. He's like dating guys that are probably like the same age as me or younger, so. <laughs> My dad's living his best life, actually. Cause like, he's like, he's not like, his, his, his HIV is like doing good and he's, now that he's like come out of the closet, he's um, he moved to Palm Springs and he's like he's like happy now. But I I haven't spoken to anyone in my family in um, a long time. I actually got stopped recently by a cop because I I didn't know this, but they had put out um, a missing person report for me. So that was like kind of sad, you know? But I just don't want to like stress them out with, I'd rather them like just not have to know. You know what I mean? Because I just know it would like kill my family. Just to know like just the things that I'm dealing with like on a daily basis, like. And I know that, like, my grandma, like, I love my grandma. Like, she basically, like, 
raised me and I know if like she could take away the pain and change it, she would, but she can't, you know? Um, my grandma, she, after, when I was 15, after that whole thing happened, living with my friend and all that, the guy with the heroin, um, my dad ended up selling the house and calling us on a Sunday and saying, I'm moving on Thursday with or without you guys. Turned out he had been embezzling money and was on the run. We didn't know that then, but he just left. He just left us. So I was like couch surfing and my grandma came and she found us and um, we went to go live with them. And to this day, like my grandma is like, I consider her like my, um, She's, I consider her like my parent, like, you know what I mean? And she's the only one that I really kind of keep in contact with. But again, it's just lies. I'm lying to her about everything. And I, and I hate saying that because I love her. You shouldn't lie to people you love, but I, she's also in her 80s and I don't want to kill someone I love with stress of being, you know what I mean? of being like, I'm doing this, I'm doing that. So I'd rather her just like, like be happy and like stress free and like think I'm like doing good. And like, you know, that's pretty much it. <sighs> All right. Sarah, thank you so much for sharing your story. Yeah. I wish you lots of luck getting, getting out of here, getting back with the kids. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much.